stopping by. Uh, this is the, uh, the Pain Hour with me, John, and my good buddy. Hello? John's ready? Yeah, there we go. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, we're both working on a couple of models today, uh, going over different techniques. Um, I'm going to be doing a lot of color blending on this fish man and some of the other guys that I have with me, and I'll probably be showing different techniques on how to do that. Um, but I'm still doing the beast coding process, so while I'm doing all this, we have uh, Sean, who is working on uh, the Mega Cockroach himself, uh, Old One-Eye. Uh, I'm going to be working on the page highlight. Yeah. He's covered in all sorts of spines and armor plates, so I'm, I'm painting all the highlights on the edges. Which isn't yeah. most of them, but I'm going to do some uh, really fine detail. Yeah, so we've, <laughs> we've gone over both of these before, but it's good to go over it more and more because while well, me and Sean both have different techniques and it's kind of good to see something like edge highlighting compared to uh, color blending like I'm doing um, just because you can see the impact it has on the model they're both dramatic impacts but they they complete different effects so yeah um, I'll be watching and paying attention to comments so if you guys had anything to say wanted to talk or do whatever just just let me know so yeah, uh, take it away. Take it away, Sean. Okay, well, um, so for the, uh, you know, the, the plan we've done for the Tyranids is a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a really dark green. So that's the Caliban green with a uh, wash of non-oil to get a really nice and really deep uh, color. And then I come back in with uh, the Caliban green and Warpstone glow, which uh, will as, we'll just kind of build up the highlight and then then it's then it'll move on to pure highlights of just the warpstone glow, and then mix with yellow to you know on the finest highlights. Oh, uh -oh. There we go. So that's what I'm doing so far. So I'm going. I've done most of the uh, highlighting, the edge highlighting, but I'm now going back and seeing places where once once the color kind of dries and it kind of settles in, sometimes you just, you have to figure out it might need another highlight. So my key for this is that when I do edge highlighting, I have to make sure the paint is very wet. So it, coat, so it, so it gets off the brush very easily and doesn't dust. Yeah. Yeah, I actually had a question about Games Workshop's edge paints uh, yesterday, which I was kind of glad to get um, because they are a good line of paints. Uh, they are designed to do what they're supposed to do and do edge highlighting and the reason why they're able to do that so well is the fact that they are thinned down paints but they still have a lot of pigment to them right so you don't have to worry about like when you water it down it becoming too watery and not having enough impact yeah in the past some of the GW, GW paints have been really weak once you water them down yeah which is no bueno So it's always nice to see them fix stuff like that or come out with new products to help out. So In the past, I've actually used uh, Vallejo for edging because you can thin that down and it'll stay opaque. Yeah. I'm actually in the process of uh, fixing up some primer mistakes on my guy right now. One of the things that drives me crazy with working with uh, metal models is catch everything in the priming phase, it can really kind of screw things up. Yeah. Um, but luckily, the areas where the primer didn't quite catch are all on the interior. That's good. <coughs> like it's, so yeah, it, it's, it's just bad when it gets on like on a uh, highlight point. Yeah. And it's really hard to correct that. So yeah, what I normally would recommend for you guys, um, especially if you're working with metal models and you catch an area, that's unprimed. Uh, you gotta, you gotta go through almost like an internal review process and be like, how likely is it for that area to become in contact with something else? So if you think that for any second that like you know you'll bump into it with a um, like finger or it'll come in contact with another model, that paint's going to chip right off. Um, so yeah, if, if you're painting the model and you see that you missed the spot priming. Um, I always recommend having like a little pot of paint on primer with you, um, 
just basically to kind of help smooth out stuff like that. Yeah, I have a, I have a pot of uh, craft paint. Cheap, and it's uh, it dries opaque, so it's good to... Uh, it dries thick and opaque, which, uh, if you use it right, is a good place to kind of fill it in those fill in those places where the the primer missed. Yeah. It's harder to, harder to do on like a you're gonna prime prime uh if you prime white. Yeah, priming white to me is a separate skill set at this point. Uh yeah. Priming white, uh there's so many white primers out there that have a tendency to fuzz up or not coat the model super well. Powdering. Yeah, yeah I'm almost always uh working with um like airbrush white primers because um, I feel like those are the most consistent you yeah. don't have to worry about it as much I need to try that cause let, my last like three attempts at uh, using various sprays have just been disastrous yeah so it's like one of those things where it's like working with white, white primer can definitely help speed along the model process or give you another effect like uh, like if you're wanting to do like a super spectral army or something that's very bright uh, white priming is a slam dunk um, a lot of the times um, right. because you get that nice light tone and all you have to do is do some some washes over it well you know I, I painted a uh, imperial fist arm and there's no way I could, you know, there's no way I was going to do that without a white primer right yeah and doing something very light colored like an imperial fist like something that's yellow or um, something bright along those lines white scars yeah White scars being another big offender of needing that white primer. Well, I guess those who are like painting gear like a, the Imperial Assault Stormtroopers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, white primer will go uh, a, a big way. Just uh, helping you start. There, there's no way, to, no reason not to say that you can't prime it. I don't know why I'm using so many negatives in my speech, but uh, you can prime it white and save yourself a whole lot of time. And with that being said, you can still do it with black primer. It just takes more steps. You're going to have to work from black to white, which is literally two different sides of the spectrum. So, well, well the trouble is if you if you work from a black primer, any you can go to bright colors, but they're all good, always going to be a little duller than you know, the equivalent. So you could do a white, but it's going to be it's going to be a little duller. It won't be nearly as bright, or else it's going to take a lot of codes. Uh, I guess you know, I don't know if people have been. Uh, Watching me uh, doing the edge highlight, but I just want to point out when I when I paint with the edge, when I'm doing edge highlight on hard surfaces like the carapace, I don't actually paint with the tip of the brush. I paint with the edge of the brush. I paint it like a knife. Yeah, and a lot of that that technique in itself allows you to avoid more human error on it. Um, so, like when you're using the edge, your your lines will be consistent or more consistent than if you were trying to like traditionally paint a line on a model. Right, I'm, I'm just letting, the, uh, I'm letting the, the surface of the model define where my brush goes. So downside is it kind of kills your brush. Yes. Uh, unfortunately in the, the painting, painting biz, brush life expectancy is not super long. Like generally, if I can get like six months out of a brush, I'm pretty happy. With how hard I am with them. Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, we've talked before how you know my brushes kind of go for and they, they kind of evolve. They uh, they start you know I might have a uh, standard brush which because it starts fraying starts turning into a detail brush because it just loses bristles and then it's you know, if it starts spreading out it becomes a wash brush or a dry brush. And eventually, it might just become a mixing brush. Yeah. So my brushes don't retire easily. So I'm moving on to the color blending. I started with Crick's Bane Base, and I'm now using uh, Trader Green uh, mixed with a little bit of Crick's Bane base, base, and it's really watered down. Uh, and so what that lets me do is move from this mixture to the actual uh, Trader Green, and lets me have a little bit more control over that blend. It's basically giving me a nice wet surface that's not overly uh, dry to work on which allows me to put these nice color transitions in there. Um, it might be a little difficult to see on stream because right now it's pretty subtle, um, but I'm hoping 
as I do more and more steps, I'll start to see the pattern. Okay, uh, I've more or less finished all the edging highlighting of the carapace. Now I'm adding an extra detail. Since this is old one eye, we wanted his claws to really stand out, so the leading edge of his claws, with lobster claws and the scythes, and the spines along his back are going to be glowing orange, like the uh, the uh, Swarm Lord I did earlier. So, so I wanted his, you know, his back spines look like Godzilla's spines lighting up. So it's going to be starting with a uh, doing a simple red edge on the inside surface. I I, I hear you, Emily. I'm, I'm moving the model back. What? I was uh, painting off camera. Oh. Okay. It, it was because I was handing it off to the actual painter. You, know. yeah, you just reach under the counter. We we prepared this earlier. <laughs> Working on uh, like working on color blending, there's there's a lot of different techniques out there. Um, two brush blending and layering being the, uh, what, what? the the major two that you'll probably hear about at any given point. Um, what I'm doing is a little bit of a combination of the two. Um, so, like I'm doing, I'm putting an overly wet mixture down that's super thin, and I'm working it in. So you're doing some good wet blending. Do you do wet brushing or just pr just wet paint brushing on? would be the uh, probably the, the best one. Okay, that's my preferred method. To me, it's just easier to do. Getting this nice, like, boggy green cloak that he's wearing. Okay, so I finished the first pass of this claws. John. Oh, oh, nice. The, yeah. You know, the, the, the suggestion of the red, which will not only uh, give you a nice red underneath the orange, but also, and then which will blend to yellow, it also just gives the bright colors something to stick to other than black. Remember what I was saying about. The, you know, a bright color over black is going to be muted. So, yeah. So I'm kind of. So the, the red I'm doing is actually acting as kind of a, uh, a secondary base coat, for the uh, for the glow. Sort of. So I'm probably going to have to make a wash to come back and. Knock. Knock down some shadows. Um, in this guy's clothes and the the reasons for that is just to like up the contrast level um, and to really kind of pull the clothing the the details of the clothes away from the model itself so um, it's more or less adding an artificial line to the model to help draw the eye and especially since this guy's this guy's not going to go into a showcase or anything like that. He's going to be on the field. And so I like having that bit of contrast, that that line to pop out different areas from each other. So I can really see that from a tabletop perspective. I know, Sean, you're a big fan of that. And you normally go like heavy, heavy dark. Yeah, I, I, well, I go for naturalistic, which you know, has its good and bad points. So the bad point being that yeah, from it it, it looks less like le less visually appealing at you know at about five feet away. Yeah. I like I like my bright colors. Yeah, I find I find working in bright colors kind of unnatural. Uh, but yeah, there you go. Yeah. There we go. Like we said, we both have our own unique ways of painting. Everyone has their own style to it, just like in art and all that. So it's uh, important to make sure that like when you guys are watching tutorials and things like that, um, definitely seeking out people that, you know, uh, one, have something valuable to teach to you, but also that work in the way that fits your your personal style as well. Correct. Or the style that you want to do. Right. I mean, yeah, anyone who's going to anyone who's going to do a tutorial, well, 
they've been through, they've probably done years of develop their own styles. So, you know, they're, they're good at their style. So don't worry about. Yeah. I mean, the best, the best, the best teacher teachers are the ones that will show you how they did it, and then, and help you figure out the way for you to, for you to kind of develop your own thing, and instead of just aping what they're doing. Yeah. Bright highlights here. Yeah. Well, I figure the uh, with his with his kind of naturalistic highlighting and the uh, the dark greens and the dark and the dark browns, the glowing edges of his of his uh, claws will really stand out. So like, like shoot a guy and suddenly the mouth is showing up. So yeah, I'm working on all of his cloth. It's all this kind of boggy green, um, which generally I would work in a much brighter color. But I kind of wanted this guy to be a little bit muted. He's a support character. Uh, he shouldn't upstage uh, his warlock, leading him into battle. Plus, you know, he's kind of he's a fish man dressed in fishing nets. He's just not gonna. He's not going to be that bright. <laughs> Here you go. How's that look? Oh yeah, that's looking great. Just, you know, to remind everybody, when you're doing this kind of blending and and uh, edge highlight, wash your brush a lot. Yeah, you don't want the remnants of uh, another color or another step being so stuck on it. Well, the other problem is sometimes if you have just chunks of dried paint in the brush, oh, yeah. it actually like, can impart some sort of weird texture into your next layer. Plus, of course, you know, it, it might fray the brush and uh, might kill your brush faster than you expect it to. So, I got the I got the highlight on the blade where I want it, but I'm going to make I'm going to kind of ext I'm going to soften that edge because I, I want it to look like you know heat instead of uh, instead of the edge of a plate. So what I'm doing is I'm doing a kind of dry brush at the edge of the at the edge of that highlight, so it just blends right into the black. Almost dusting. I mean, you know, we have the, there's like the dusts that people use. See. Now, you know, that'll take a couple passes because I just want to build that up. Or oh, just a lot of people watching. Okay. We have Bobby watching, Babu. Sweet, sweet Babu. <laughs> Emily's watching. Joe's watching. Uh, yeah. A lot of people are talking about the uh, the new CID for War Machine Awards that just came out. And they put in a lot of new stuff to the game with it, so I know a lot of people are hyped. For uh, War Machine? Yeah. Um, so they moved over to the system called uh, Community Integrated Development, where like pretty much every other month or so, they'll put models up for playtesting. And so you get to really see stuff like way in advance. Um, and you get to test out it and, you know, make sure that when it comes out into the game, it's nice and balanced. <laughs> Uh, that being said, sometimes still will slip by, and they're able to retroactively fix it with like erratas and things like that. Um, do you remember Haley? Yeah. 
Uh, she got a nerf again today. Uh, but once again, it's not finalized, it's being tested. If that nerf is too much, too little, um, undeserved, X, Y, Z. So the community will be able to test it, play some games, do some battle reports, give feedback to the company. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're like me, it, it, to me that sounds like early access video games. <laughs> uh, Emily asked uh, how long it normally takes to paint a model. That's a good question. Uh, it honestly depends on how long or how much effort you want to put into an individual model. Oh, and I mean, it just also depends on the model. I mean, yeah. the one I hear it took, it's taking twice as long as, as like a Tyranny of Warrior. Yeah. Whereas your fish guy, is, he's, he's a character, so he's got a lot of detail in him. Yeah, so like it, it basically depends on the, the, the detail in the model and all that. There's a lot of ways of fudging detail and making it go super quick. So for like a baseline infantry model, maybe four hours per model, I think. Yeah, I, I don't really keep track too well, especially since if I'm working on infantry, if I'm working like a line infantry guy, I'll probably be working at four at a time. Yeah, and that's the other thing is like working on multiple at the time, like as outside of characters, um, is a good way of saving time. But generally speaking, for like to answer that question specifically. Uh, like doing a character like this could be anywhere from like four hours if he doesn't have a lot of detail um, to about eight or so. It just depends on the amount of time. Um, right now I'm about two hours in on this guy and I've gotten his skin tone done and the first couple of steps done on his cloth, clothes. Um, and then after that I have to do his accent fins, his base, and his weapons. So. Yeah, probably about eight hours for this guy. Um, yeah. But as you're beginning, you're, it, it'll be weird because your paint times will sometimes be really short at first. Um, I remember when I first started painting, like I painted stuff super quick. But then again, like I wasn't doing any advanced techniques. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can start seeing that nice Is it glow see? blend. Does it show up on there? Uh, it better. <laughs> yeah. uh, for those that can't see or it doesn't turn out well for the camera um, the the glowing orange effect um, or the edge effect that Sean's doing is really soft so like it's not like super stark hard line layering it's a it's a gradual build up from this like dark dark color up to this like fluorescent orange that it's going up to so yeah Effectively, what I did was I started with a corn red over the black, <clears throat> and then I blended in from there. I blended in uh, Troll Slayer orange, which is kind of a softer, lighter orange, and then moved on from there to using the P3 orange, which is a lot brighter. Yeah, uh, that's what I like about the P3 stuff is that they all have a tendency to be pretty, pretty bright. Um, and then, and then final highlight of yellow mixed in with that. But I'm using a really, I'm using one of my dry brush brushes, so it's really soft, and I'm effectively a mixture of wet brush and, and some dry brush, because at that point it's almost a dust. Yeah. Uh, to a elaborate a little bit more on Emily's question, um, or what I started saying, um, is like when you first get started, you'll you'll probably knock out models really quick, but you won't know all the techniques and things like that. You'll probably start with a couple of base base layers and all that, and uh, a single model might take a couple of hours to four hours to get done. Um, and then you start learning more techniques or start experimenting with uh, color theory and things like that. And what took you a couple hours before is now taking you like eight to 12. <laughs> and then finally you get comfortable with the techniques that you know, and when you start applying tried and true methods on models in the future, you cut the time back down. So right. yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, 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 the amount of stuff you do on a figure increases, but the amount of time you have to spend, say, going back and fixing things or deciding on stuff goes down. So yeah, because I have a tendency when I'm like doing a new technique, I'll cautiously apply it, and like when I finally know what I'm doing or I'm comfortable with it, I'll just wing it, and usually winging it turns out absolutely fine. Um, that's another thing <laughs> that like I'll normally get myself on is I'll be too detailed oriented and so I'll take a lot of time focusing on a single detail that may not be seen from the model 
like once it's done, like an eye hidden by a cloak or. But you'll know it. <laughs> yeah, and, and that, that's the problem is like, like sometimes I'll skip those things and be like, okay, I won't see those from, from a distance. And it's true, I finish the model, I don't do that detail. But then I sit and stare at it. I know that eye isn't painted. I see you. Yeah, uh, but it's one of those things that you get comfortable with and all that. Um, and especially as a commission painter, learning what details need to be painted versus what doesn't is a huge like level up step. Uh, because when you're commission painting, your your time is is money. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, one one thing is when I do commission when I do commission painting. Is because because I could do commission painting and I end up like painting things, you know. There's some armories I've only ever painted as commission, so I have no experience painting them. So first, uh, often the first model of an army will be take the longest. Yeah. Because I have to figure out those hairs. No. That's a bu belt buckle, or is that a just like a bolt, or is that a jewel? Yeah, I remember when I had to paint 38 Doom Reavers in a weekend. Mm -hmm for a tournament. I think I was talking about talking about this last time on stream. But basically like I had to learn how to paint all these models on the fly and have to be very efficient with what I was doing because I only had, you know, forty eight hours to do it and I had no prior experience. Uh, yeah, so so I'm not sure. You've met Emily, right? Yeah, Sean. Yeah. Uh, so she has her masters in sequential from from SCAD. Yeah. Um, and she's talking about in a miniature uh, side of things, like how often do we have to take a break from working on an individual model before we start getting eye strain oh. or start losing details? Um, I, if I'm, I take breaks. Yeah, I, I often do. If I'm working on a single model and it's starting to kind of. Uh, the details starting to get annoying. I'll take breaks on it, uh, or you know, if I if I'm working on a group, I, I hit a point where I know that they have to dry. That's, yeah, it's like okay, everyone's not, everyone's got to wash. I know I have five or six minutes. I can not be staring at these figures. That's that's a probably true for me too. Where um, if I'm taking the day to paint, um, which I need to take more more of, desperately falling behind on stuff. Um, but like I'll, I'll do a step to where I know it has a dry time or a certain amount of prep time and I'll use that to take a break from the figure um, but yeah I do get like a fair amount of eye strain from staring at something so small and so up close that like I'll lose sight of certain things so taking those breaks uh, I usually try to get one in like once every couple hours like probably two hours is, is good where I'll set the model down I'll go look at something far away for a bit um, and then I'll come back and I'll re-examine the model see if I missed any spots or if I got any uh, details wrong or if I even like the the techniques that I'm using on the model itself oh well, yeah so, well sometimes sometimes uh, taking a break you come back you're like oh that looks terrible yeah I mean and that's that's something that you, you can always fix. You can always be like, okay, wow, I really don't like how I applied that, that technique or that color, so let's let's figure out something else. How's that look? Oh yeah, the inside of the interior of the cloth is looking real good. Um, so going with the, one method I've been doing is I'm dusting and uh, stippling with the, uh, with the dry brush. So just, you know, just dotting, take advantage, you know, so you can see this brush is just, you know, this brush is ruined, so it's the its job is now a dry brush. <laughs> but that's good because it means it's really soft and, and produces a kind of roughly round shape when you do when you uh, dust it. So, so I've done the two claws, and I might come back on these claws, uh, or sometimes you know acrylic paint f kind of fades as it dries. So sometimes it's a matter of I got to. Uh, because it, because it fades as it dries, I have to uh, wait for it to dry to see if I need to make another highlight. Especially like oranges and yellows, which will just, just fade almost back to back to orange 
back to a light orange very easily. So yeah, I got to come back to this. Let's also, another step that makes me step away from the model is I'm pretty pretty handsy with the models that I have. So like when I finish a delicate detail or a step or something like that, I'll generally matte coat it. Oh, yeah. So I don't rub off that that feature or whatever I was working on before. That's true, that's a good idea. So I'm now working on the uh, the next step of this cloth and I'm adding a pretty stark highlight which is the um, Thrall Flesh from Privateer Press. It is um, kind of the next color up. That's a good, that's a good color. It's a good Nurgle color. Yeah. So I'm starting to highlight, I'm starting the glow on the spines along his back. And it uses the same technique, so I'm doing a soft, wet brush of that red. That's the start of the glow. It's the corn red, and I'm going to do that along just on the leading edge of all the uh, leading edge, and just more or less the top, of all the uh, spines. So what's your highlight for that uh, thrall flesh? Uh, so this is the final highlight. Oh, okay. So I'm probably not going to go brighter. Um, if I did, if I did have to go brighter, it'd probably be Menoth White highlight, which is that kind of yellowish off white. Um, generally speaking, like when I'm working with greens, um, if I'm doing like a warm green, I almost always end up with a, a final highlight of a yellow or something closer to yellow than what I started. And that's just a bit of a color theory and like using warmth to pull forward details. Yeah, I guess it's, I did want to mention that for those of you who do highlights, don't necessarily, your instinct might be to add white to it, white to your highlight color. And that's not, that's probably not a good idea because white can just kind of kill the color. Yeah. Could, and, or it can come out chalky. Whereas something like the Minoth, the Minoth like off-white. When did I go for off-white? I, I like the uh, Rackhart's flesh for the same reason. Yeah, I think the Rackhart, the, the Rackhart threat flesh is a little bit cooler than the men off, yeah. if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's much duller, but it's if 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 anything, that's you'd uh, in your highlight, you'd actually add white to it. Yeah. So it, so it main so the, the the white will bring some brightness to it, but the the record has has the green and brown in it already, so it kind of avoids that kind of chalky effect. Okay. Ouch. So yeah, um, I'm actually using, um, like this model's coming out a lot darker than I normally do models. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. One, it's just to push myself to do something a little different and to see if I can still make that contrast happen with darker, desaturated shades. And it's, it's going well so far for me. Uh, from, my, from my perspective, it's perfect. Yeah. I, I love those kind of dull colors. So it's, it's one of those things where, once again, this isn't in my wheelhouse, but making myself do something like this um, lets me kind of do stuff with the, or learn different techniques kind of thing and be able to approach, you know, maybe I'll have a client in the near future who wants something a little bit more realistic or a little bit more dull like this. Um, I'd like to be more well-versed in that than trying to feed him something that's more my style whoa, than whoa, whoa. what he necessarily yeah, wants. Wow. Here's the uh, spines I'm starting up. Hey, John. Oh, nice. Wow. So, it was all really, so again, they use the same technique. So it's the, uh, the, the red followed by the orange, then the lighter orange, and then the yellow as the, uh, the final highlight. So yeah, I am. Like, just going back to Emily's question, uh, old one I hear has taken you know several days, but he's a character, so I'm putting the extra effort into him. Yeah, he he will be a centerpiece in the army. So, Whereas, you know, the Tyrion of Warriors, I I worked on those. I, I did the first one as the test model, so he took a while. But the other two, to, to fill up, to fill up the unit, those took only a couple of hours. 
because you know I, I identified what order to do things in the, the kind of the drying time involved so they they, they dry they uh, came together much quicker certain armies like the Crimson Fist I've been working on they paint up very fast now yeah because I'm not surprised by anything any details on them anymore so many I'm trying to sell um, Emily on War Machine and Hordes okay uh Mostly because there's a, a faction comprised of birds and wolves. Oh well, sure, yeah. And that's and that's the faction of naturalistic colors. Yep. Oh, also Emily just says that uh, tanks are now available. Hey, David. No, he's gone. Tanks. Yeah, we can now make tank tops. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not, not like I thought we were Panzer talking. tanks. I'm sorry. I, saw, I thought we were still talking about War Machine. It's like, I know no, no, no. Sorry. Uh, uh, Emily uh, does the T-shirts for oh, that's right. the store. So, um, as per conversation that started earlier today, of what what it would take to get some people into some Giga swag, well, uh, yeah. some requested for tank tops. You heard it here first. Yeah. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, I hope Mark only wears tank tops from this point forward. <laughs> I guess that would be technically in uniform. We're gonna call it, this is a call for muffin tops. Do you ever watch uh, Always Sunny? Yes. Mark is our Mac. Okay. Just, just guns, guns out. Yeah. Is he not DeVito? Dave, David's our DeVito. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and that doesn't face Sean one bit. I mean, no. no. There you go. It's coming along. Again, I wanted him to. I wanted uh, one I here to be painted. It looked like uh, you know, look, his spines will look like Godzilla uh, revving up. Yeah. So. The, the radioactive glow, and they're actually going to be stronger at the tips than the claws because they're running down the center of the model. So I want them to really stand out. Good. Oh, I'm, I'm painting off camera again. We're trying to at least. One day. Well, you know, when I paint, my hands don't stay in one place. Especially as they get tired, I kind of rest my arms a different way. Yeah. Where I, you know, I have to come at a certain angle, so. I'm just gonna have a John sit next to me and slap my hand with a ruler every time I no. start going off camera. We just, just need a little bit more to your right. We just, just right. if you do it directly over the blue marks, you're good. We just need a cameraman, you know, just kind of C constantly keeping track. Yeah. Okay, we just not or GoPros. They're really disorient people. So I'm basically doing some edge highlighting um, where his cowl kind of covers the um, loincloth. And that's mainly to um, really kind of separate the two pieces. I'll probably come in and do a wash like I was talking about later to uh, push that. Uh, contrast a little bit more and make sure that those two pieces of clothing feel like two separate fully realized pieces. So yeah, working on this guy is a lot of fun. I always love these minis. The little fish people and gator men and well, yes, they're fun. In the process of working on the uh, the Aztec Mayan gators next. You saw all those reference photos. I yes, did. I did. I was about to thank you for all those. Um, I just collect random pictures every. Yeah, day. Uh, I figured you would not let me down, especially when it comes to historically accurate. Oh, you have a second one. Armaments. 
don't get much call for actually painting real Aztecs or, or Toltecs or any of the other uh, tribes. I'm not sure if I told you this, but uh, my high school is actually a registered museum in addition to being a high school. Oh, that's cool. What's yeah. That? What are they at? Um, it, it's in Houston. Um, but one of the big things is that they have a lot of Central American artifacts in there. Oh, nice. And they have this like gorgeous statue of a Mayan warrior in like. Um, <laughs> He's basically in feathered armor. Yeah. Like to make look like a, a, a warbird of some kind. He was a hawk, hawk warrior. Yeah. They were called. So I, I think I'm going to try to do a gator with a uh, feathered cow over yeah. him and then like a bird mask sitting on top of his head. Um, I think that would be pretty neat. And you saw the shaman in the, uh, the skin suit. Yeah. That's, that, like, I might be able to do that. Like, um, a full body sculpt over a whole figure. Mostly. And you're mostly in the form of a drape, really. Yeah, well, well, that's the thing is like maybe making like a skin-like poncho because um, with the the wrestler, he's wearing a skin mask in itself. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So it, it's not outside of their their routine to do. But it it, it, it depends on the time. And like, I have a problem with like <laughs> sculpting drapery. It's a little too delicate for green stuff for me uh, I've, I, 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 I learned of one technique to do drapery was was to uh, roll out a sheet of it yeah give it a couple hours to dry and then mm, okay I might have to give that a shot Lord then, knows I have you, enough green stuff as then you, you, you lay out a little sheet of it and then you, you know, make it as, as uniform as you can and that it'll be smooth yeah. and then you cut it into uh, ladies and gentlemen Michael Chanel has entered the building <laughs> Michael Chanel is in the building. <laughs> if you guys can hear the clapping, it's uh, it's for for uh, a friend of the store, Chanel. So you uh, so the you know so you lay it out flat, let it let it kind of set for a couple hours, then you cut it out into sheets, and that's where you could drape it because that way it won't stretch as much and it won't take your thumb your your fingerprints as much. Yeah, I'll have to try but, that out. But it's still malleable and still bendable. That sounds like a, uh, a good time for me. Because that's how I made all my capes and uh, kilts for my, like, Welsh for Saga. Did the uh, stream go down? Uh, no. Uh, Weird. Oh, my Facebook cut out. Was the only... Oh, I think my Facebook crashed, not necessarily the stream. Here you go, John. Oh, yeah, that looks great. Is he showing up, uh, John? Yeah, it shows. So, uh, you know, it's, there's a kind of a subtle blend up to a, a very bright, but I wanted him to just, they, this is this way he'll really stand out from the normal um, uh, artifacts is over the whole, the rest of the table. Let's see, next, moving on to the next one. So, I've done two. Half the body and the spines, and now I can move on to the other blades. I'm going to be working on a wash for this guy, um, for the cloak, and I'm starting with uh, Thamar Black, which is pure black. The base color that I did, which is Crick's Bane, Crick Bane base. And then I'm going to add a little bit of purple in it, um, just to give it a bit of a color change, a, a tonal difference. Um, well, plus that works because you have so much green in the pit in your uh, in your figure, a little purple would be a good contrast. Yeah. So, like I said, it, it's mainly to build contrast and pull the details away from each other. Yeah. Um, so now it's the process of thinning this down. And you know, purple's a cooler color, um, so with that, it works great for shades and such because it does have that ability to pull color away. And so I have to thin it down to the point where it can be applied as a wash. So like, I need it super thin and less translucent. A lot of people will use um, mixing medium with this um, to help keep the paint consistency and let it be a little less streaky. 
Um, but the fact that this is for um, like this kind of like bog cloth, I'm not as concerned with it. Oh, I, I say with a question mark. Though I will, uh, I will point out something that this goes back to what I said earlier. Uh, you know, don't necessarily automatically go for white for your highlights, and don't necessarily go to black for your shade for shading. Right. As you said, because you used purple, which is, uh, you know, you had some black, but, you know, purple is a good way to tone down a color without getting too murky. So, so this is one of those steps where I will definitely let it dry and sit. <laughs> That's the one you get up and walk around to uh, spare your eyes and your back. Yeah. That's um, a big, a big thing, especially if you're painting. You're going to be sitting down in a chair, or a stool, or whatever for for multiple hours. Do do yourself a favor. Just get up, walk around. Now, I've seen I've seen uh, people whose technique involves painting while they're lying down, which looks really comfortable. But I don't think I could I could pull it off. That sounds like madness, Sean. Let me. I didn't say I could do it. <laughs> I've just seen photos. You know, there's like. You know, effectively, their painting desk is a tray that sits on their chest. <laughs> Those people are the true heroes. Yes, but you know, it does also mean that uh, you are stuck there. <laughs> yeah. I'm like you, because you know, oh, I need to get up for any reason. Well, that means I have to take apart my entire paint setup. And that might be a reason to uh, like you know force yourself to paint or something like that, like. <laughs> Like, nope, well, I guess I, I guess I'm stuck here anyways. Yep, I'll just stay here until I can finish the, the squad. I don't know. Okay. Now this uh this this side's claws are going much faster than the first side because I, I kind of figured out my technique. So figured out what will I, you know, what effort, how much effort do I have to do to show off this detail? Turns out not much, mm -hmm. so I can go much faster. There you go. First pass. So I'm going ahead and being a little bit aggressive with this wash around. Aggressive? <laughs> huh? It's just an interesting word. Uh, yeah, with this wash around the, uh, the bone headpiece. Um... And the reason I'm doing that is I want to make sure that there is a nice dark tone for it when I come back with these uh, the bone colors to kind of pop it out. Right. Um, just because I want that contrast to be there. Because this um, this light green that I have going, this like light olive green, can easily easily read the same as bone. So I want to make sure that this like oh yeah yeah cool purple wash is there at every kind of. Uh, crease of it to make sure that it definitely reads as its own thing right, right. Um, and not an extension of the cloth. Good So also using this wash for like armpits and kind of creases in the skin is another good thing to just the uh, once again pop contrast, make sure that things aren't reading as like one big amorphous blob. So yeah. I'm seeing areas where I'm rubbing off paint. No. <laughs> That's the trouble with working with metal models. Yeah. Metal models, you know, don't, the metal does not want paint to stick to it. No, it doesn't. I wish. I know I'm the minority because, you know, private presses, plastics aren't the best in the business yet. Uh, but I would love for more things to be in plastic just so I don't have to worry about, you know, my paint rubbing off and all that sort of sort of stuff. Sure. 
So as soon as the stream's done, I'm going to be washing, uh, not washing this guy, but dull coating this guy just so I can... Just to safeguard him. Yep, because I want all this paint to stick. I'm really enjoying where his, this model's going. And the last thing I want to do is ruin that with, you know, my fat fingers rubbing off paint. So yeah, uh, we are actually hitting the top of the hour, and uh, so we're probably just going to go ahead and take off soon, uh, but we do appreciate everyone coming by and watching the stream and asking questions. It's very appreciated. And uh, we'll see you guys next week for our pre-Dragon Con, oh my god, we have to paint everything uh, event. So yeah, we'll see you guys uh, next week. Okay. Yeah. See you later.